will praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day you've given to us. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you to praise and worship you. We pray that you would be in the midst of this service, that your spirit would rest upon this place physically and upon this broadcast, that all those who come in touch with this service will feel your presence and will come to know you in a greater way. We just pray that you would meet us here today and dwell within us, that we would be greater representatives for you. Be with us during this time of worship. Be with us during this time of praise. Be with us during this time of fellowship. Just refresh us that when we are done with this service and we go back to where we're going, to what you've done for us, that people would come to see you and come to know you because of the encounter that we've had with you during this day. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for service today. Um, on, yeah, today is Palm Sunday, so... This is one of the holy days in the year for those of us who identify as Christians. So as such, this is the day like we know that um, this would be considered the beginning of Holy Week because this is the day that we celebrate Jesus arriving into Jerusalem. Um, and of course, the people as he came into Jerusalem riding on the back of the donkey were waving palms and shouting Hosanna, which translates Lord save us. And of course, we celebrate this usually in the church by giving out palms, which we may also wave during service at certain points. So since it's just us today, um, how we are representing Palm Sunday is with this lovely palm cross that's right behind us, as you can see. In the way. <laughs> uh, don't worry, First Lady, they can still see it over you. And okay. so it's a lovely cross. But hopefully when we're able to come together again in some form by next year, hopefully we'll be able to wave palms together. So, but that's what we're doing. And, you know, if you have your palms where you are, feel free to wave them at certain points. Because as always, um, for um, Palm Sunday, we chose a song that um, is fast, that has the word Hosanna in it. So, when we say Hosanna, if you got palms with you, feel free to wave the palms. But, you know, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because, you know, we still have some steps we go through before we get to the song. So first, we just want to thank all of you who have been supporting us from the beginning. Those of you who are continuing to support us, you know, whether it's through donations, through kind words, through sharing the things that we're doing here. I mean, it's just until you're in this position and you don't know like how big of a deal a kind word on the side can be. And so we just want to thank all of you for that. All of you who have done your own, well, in your own way, helped us to stay afloat. We really appreciate you. Ministry is difficult enough under normal circumstances, but we're in the midst of a pandemic. And yes, I've been a pastor for about a year, but I'm a pastor who's been pastoring for about a year out of his basement and hasn't actually been able to see his congregation. So, you know, we really do appreciate the kind words that we get from you. We appreciate the times we spend together during our um, first Sunday fellowships or just during any other time that God makes it possible for us to interact. And, you know, even though we're in the midst of this pandemic, we're still thankful for the technology that makes it possible for us to come together. Um, of course, we have some things that we're going to talk about a bit more during the announcements. This is the last Sunday of Women's History Month, so we're going to um, acknowledge a few more women who've made a big impact on the history and the overall trajectory of Your Will Christian Ministries. We're also going to talk about some things that have been happening in the community, give a little bit of an update on our missions offering, and... Yeah, so we're going to do all those things after the song. But right now, before we get to the song, I want to encourage all of you who feel led to do so to share this broadcast. Um, we're going to share. The reason I always encourage you to share is because that's how people find out we exist. And, you know, it's still pretty much word of mouth right now. 
Um, we understand that so many churches are streaming right now. And so the easiest way for people to find out we exist is if, you know, you as our supporters share with your networks and then maybe they'll check us out because they trust your judgment. So with that, I am going to share right now with my social media. And also, if you decide even later on, you watch this a while after, you know, it's not live anymore and you still feel like you got something out of this, feel free to share because that's the blessing about recordings, you know. You don't have to be with us live in order to share. And people don't have to watch with us live in order to participate. So I am about to share right now, as soon as I find it. If you watch this every week, you know that I always have trouble finding our service. But I did find it today. It looks like there were several of you have beaten me to sharing because we had 10 shares already today. So thank you all. And if you're my friend on Facebook or you just follow me in a public sense, you see that I have shared this with the caption happening right now. So now I'm going to get to the song that um, we've chosen for today. It's a song that if you're from the Philadelphia area, you probably know it. And maybe if you're just a gospel music enthusiast, you know it in general. And it's a song called... Hosanna by the Wilmington Chester Mass Choir. So, and as always, because it's a choir song, obviously it's going to sound different with one voice, but I'm going to imagine that I can hear others singing it along with me. And also, if you, okay, and First Lady's going to sing a little bit. And also, uh, she'll be fine. <laughs> So, you know, but just say it's one of those songs that you have to imagine a full choir singing it. And, you know, I rearranged it a little bit to make it easier for me to get through and cut out some of the key changes. But ultimately, the reason that we're singing this song today is because it's Palm Sunday and it has the word Hosanna in it. And it's one of those songs that would be great for, again, when we are able to worship together in some form for all of us to wave our palms from side to side while praising God whenever we say Hosanna. So that is the song.
everlasting Father, there is none of you. I see the Lord sitting up on the throne and the train of the couldn't see his first lady kept singing but it's all right it's one of those songs that really does go on forever and ever and ever but it's just a few of us and we understand that you know our services have been a little long lately so i didn't mean to cut it out like that i guess if first lady had that reaction some of you might have had the same one sorry <laughs> next time we do the song i will not end it so abruptly and with that i'm gonna go back to my usual seat All right, so before we go into um, what we've been doing lately in terms of honoring women from the Hero World Christian Ministries community, um, we wanted to make a bit of a sad sort of, I guess it's not really an announcement, more like just a commentary on what's been happening in the world lately, See, for or even just in the city of Philadelphia. So for those of you who are local, you know that there was um, a shooting that took place in the Oxford Circle neighborhood. And... Um, over the course of the shooting, it was a 14-year-old boy and an 11-year-old boy who were riding on a motorbike when they were shot, and the 11-year-old boy was killed. Well, um, the 11-year-old boy was actually a neighbor of my mom, um, Deaconess Clayton. In fact, we had interacted with the boy on a few occasions, and, you know, it's always sad enough when you hear... Um, about the gun violence that happens within the city of Philadelphia and within a lot of our cities in this country. But it's even more, I guess, painful when it's somebody that's really nearby, somebody that you know, somebody whose face you can visualize. And then when you think of it as it's an 11-year-old boy on top of that, like, you know, we know that the gun violence and especially our cities across the country, has been out of hand. But I guess it just feels a different way when a child loses their life as a result of it. So I just want to encourage um, all of you who are listening to just be in prayer about what can be done about the gun violence that plagues, well, especially our black communities. 
And, you know, because no matter how we may feel about it or what the roots of it may be, what our thoughts are, the fact is that there still are too many people who are losing their lives to senseless violence in this country. And it's something that, you know, something that action needs to be done to address. Like, we do know that in terms of all the quote unquote developed nations in this world, that we have more deaths relating from gun violence than any of them do. And it's certainly a complicated, multifaceted problem that needs complex and multifaceted solutions. But I just want us to be in prayer about what we can do as individuals to make a difference in this time, to try to put an end to some of this violence that's plaguing, or really this whole country. It's not even just limited to black communities as we've been seeing with the number of mass shootings lately. You figure there was one in suburban Atlanta, one in um, Boulder, Colorado, and even in Philadelphia itself, there was one where seven people were shot outside of a bar in a pretty popular area. So something needs to be done to address the gun violence that's happening in this country. And I think we as the body of Christ need to be a part of it, a part of the conversation. So that's all. So I just want to encourage you all to be in prayer about that. And also keep the family of the 11 year old boy on my mom's block in prayer. But with that, um, we're now going to go into um, a segment that we've been, well, not necessarily a segment, I'm saying segment because I'm so used to this from our podcast, but we're going to go into a part of our service that we've been doing for the past three weeks, and that is in honor of Women's History Month. We've been talking about women who have made a difference in the Your Will Christian Ministries community. So for the last few weeks, we've, um, you know, we honored one woman for the first and second Sunday of this month. We honored two, well, and I guess I can repeat who they were. So for the first Sunday of the month, we honored Deaconess Julia Clayton, who is our first female deacon and also our church mother. For the second Sunday of the month, we honored... Um, Teresa Andrews, who serves as our church treasurer and has served as our church treasurer for over 10 years. She's been helpful since the very beginning of the ministry. She was one of our founding members. And then last week, we honored First Lady Tia, as well as Deaconess Rhonda Burroughs Griffin, um, my mother-in-law, you know, for their contributions for the church. Well, this week, we are honoring a whole lot more. So be patient. Bear with us. It's going to be a little long. So first, we are honoring Victoria Crenshaw. Yep. So if you know Victoria Crenshaw, you know she is like an unofficial member of the Euro World Christian Ministries production team. And what I mean by that is if we aren't on by a certain time, we get a text from her finding out if everything's okay. Uh, if something goes wrong with our sound, we get a text from her telling us that she can't hear us. You know, so and, you know, we appreciate that because we don't really know what our broadcasts look like or sound like going out. So it's helpful to have other people tell us when there's a problem. She is also my cousin. You know, she's been there for me my whole life, literally. She's an accountant. Um, and she also is a playwright and has worked as a stage manager for a few productions in the Philadelphia area. And the key is that she has been one of the biggest supporters of Your Will Christian Ministries from the very beginning. Even going back to 2010, we first were established, and truth be told, before that. So, Victoria Crenshaw, we salute you. And the next person is Cassandra Mickey Hart Goodson. And we really appreciate you because, like Victoria, Mickey is also an unofficial member of our Euro World Christian Ministries production team, except for Tia gets the text from Mickey, while actually both of us get the text from Vicky. But the point is that it's very nice to have people who 
are watching and letting us know when things are going well or when things are not going well and so that we can course correct. So we really appreciate you for that, Mickey. She's a very close friend, First Lady Tia. She's a two-time cancer survivor, and she has her finger on the pulse of whatever's going on in the community. Case in point, she's the reason that First Lady and I were able to get our COVID vaccinations because she knew of a place that was giving them out, and she let us know. And so it's just great to have people like that in your circle who, you know, mean you well and will help you in whatever way they can. So, Mickey, we salute you. Next is Kenise Hunter. Kenise Hunter, who was someone that I had the privilege of meeting through my friends, um, Sean Brown and Keisha Montgomery. And so Kenise, she's an entrepreneur. Um, she's a therapist. She also is a mother, an avid sports fan. In fact, she um, has her own show that she runs called Women Talk Football. And I remember like in prior years, pre-pandemic, she would travel a lot and sometimes travel to games, you know, because she loves sports that much. But she's also been a very supportive friend to um, First Lady Tia and I, and she's been supportive to your Will Christian Ministries as well. And so, Kenise, we want you to know we really do appreciate you and we thank you for the kind words and support that you've given us behind the scenes. I mean, we really want you to know that you're appreciated. So thanks, Kenise. Also, we have Renee Long. Renee Long, who is a gifted singer currently working on her own original music. She's also a talented musician. Those of us who've been around the Star of Hope community for years have stories about her playing her saxophone. You know, she's great at it. And it's funny that the song that I sang today, Hosanna, is one that I definitely remember singing with her with Star of Hope Baptist Church Mass Choir way back when. Um, one thing I like about Renee is that she has a great ministry of presence. And what I mean is that, you know, she shows up for things and she makes her presence known when she's there. And I can say that she has shown up to anything she could possibly show up to for your World Christian Ministries in a time period that First Lady Tia and I have been, you know, responsible for the church. And so... We appreciate her support and her encouragement. She's also somebody who on the services that she is watching that she is always commenting and yeah, just saying some kind words. So we really appreciate you, Renee, and thank you for the support you've given to this ministry. We also want to salute Michiko Quinones, who is a wife and mother, business agility consultant, and co-owner of Javi's Gravy, which is a nutritious dog food topper company. Think of it as adding like a nutritious type of gravy on top of the dog food that you feed. I should have said co-founder. Co-founder. This is her, her, yeah. Yeah, so co-founder. Yeah, this is her project that she and her husband do together. And um, Michiko has been a supportive friend to Your World Christian Ministries as well. And she's somebody that Tia just kind of randomly met in passing one day. More than randomly. Well, do you, well, not, I'm saying more than random. But the point is, well, do you want to correct me then? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is so weird that this is going on like this. This it's is fine. so weird. I, I didn't meet her randomly. I met her um, through doing social justice uh, activism, um, particularly um, Occupy Philadelphia, which was, oh goodness, almost 10 years ago. At this point, so uh, I've known her for a long time. She also pulled me in um, on her uh, life group that she was doing with, um, oh, why am I, Circle of Hope. Um, so I got to know Michiko really well um, throughout the years, throughout that time. So um, we wanted to thank her for her support and kindness to the ministry. Yeah. Thanks. And, and I guess I'll clarify when I said in passing, I meant is in not through a traditional channel. Oh. That's what I meant. Like you, you met her protesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is not the way that you expect to meet somebody who would still be, you know, in your life to that extent later. That's what I meant. It was like a chance. It was like a chance meeting. Yeah, it was a chance. Definitely. Yeah. Right. And then lastly, we want to salute Norma Clayton. Norma Clayton being my aunt. She's also a retired aerospace executive. She used to work for Boeing. 
She's the current chair of the Tuskegee University Board of Trustees, and she is incredibly humble in spite of her accomplishments. She has to have one of the most impressive resumes I personally have ever seen, but yet she'd still talk to you like a regular person if you had the privilege to meet her, as I'm sure um, some of you who are listening have. She's been very supportive of pretty much anything um, Tia and I have done, and I appreciate the fact that she still has made an effort to participate in things that we've been doing as a ministry, even though she's not local. That's one of the benefits that, that us having the online platform has created. It makes it possible for people to participate who maybe wouldn't usually be able to based on where they live. But we're thankful that the technology has allowed Aunt Norma to participate and to um, support us the way she has. And we also want to add in that she just celebrated a birthday recently. So also happy birthday, Aunt Norma. We appreciate you. And we know that this list could have gone on and on and on forever. We already had six women that we called out. And truth be told, there could have been a lot more because, as we know, women are the backbone of the church, especially the black church, which we're a part of. And yeah, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there have been a lot of other women, even aside from the ones that we've honored this month, who've had a big role in helping this church to continue to survive and thrive and move forward. And so to all of you, if we didn't get a chance to honor you directly, we want you to know that your contributions have not gone unnoticed. We do appreciate you. And we know that Your World Christian Ministries is what it is today because of your efforts. So we also want to thank you for your prayers and for your support. And yeah, that is it for this segment of service. And now we'll have some announcements from our First Lady. Good morning, church. So um, we this is a, a busy week coming up. Um, as as Pastor was saying, this is Holy Week. So, um, you know, uh, Good Friday and then um, Easter service next Saturday. So Good Friday, this ministry will not be doing anything in particular, but we will be sharing links to other ministries that are doing online events such as the... Um, is the seven last words. Yes. Um, so we'll be providing links so that if that's something that you're interested in um, viewing or being a part of, um, we have some links for events that are coming up this week with some ministries that we're, um, we affiliate with. So we'll be able to share that. On Saturday, we're having our women's ministry event at 3 p.m. Um, it's virtual. There is a flyer up on our page so that you can see the information. I know many of you already have the information. We have um, a spiritual life and business coach coming to speak with us. Um, and she's really laying out a framework about how to um, um, use uh, what God has given you. Oh, for those Look of you who need to see it. Look at that. Can I zoom in on that? No, I, no, I actually I actually can't zoom oh, okay. in any further. Well, there's a little flyer for you. That's the flyer. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that was coming up. I'm sorry. Um, so she's a spiritual coach and she is um helping us censor God in achieving our dreams. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then on Sunday, as you know, Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, otherwise known as Easter. Also, um, it is the first hand, uh, Sunday of the month, so it is going to be Communion Sunday. Um, make sure you have your, um, if you'd like to participate in Communion, make sure you have your representations of the body and blood of Christ. Um, the blood is a grape-based beverage. The body is a wheat or bread based beverage we do have well not a wheat or bread based beverage sorry no, I, 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 so, you know <laughs> uh, item cracker or something not beverage uh food item wheat or bread based food item um we do have some um 
communion packets that we would like to give out. If you um, would like to receive one and you're in the Philadelphia area, if you could let us know like today or Monday um, and we'll do our best to get those to you by next Sunday. Um, if not, we will still get some to you um, so that you can have them in the future. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, that, yep, that's it. We, we will have an update on what our um, what our final missions cause is. We said we want to do something mm-hmm. in response to the shooting in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. We're still looking into where we can donate for that. Mm-hmm. And also the only other thing we want to add in is that Next week, in addition to being Resurrection Sunday and Communion Sunday, is also our first anniversary as pastor and first lady of this oh. church. Because if you remember, even though we started doing the services um, for the third and fourth Sunday of March of last year, officially on paper, I did not become the pastor of the church until April 1st. So oh, wow. as a result, the first Sunday in April is always my anniversary as pastor so as of next week we i would have actually been the pastor of this church for a full year and so we're also going to celebrate that a little bit in the midst of everything else we're doing just a little bit oh we are okay um i wanted to say one more thing is that we usually have um a fellowship after our first sunday service seeing as though it is easter sunday and folks often have plans we said that we are going to uh, postpone that fellowship. It'll most likely take place the next uh, Sunday, but we'll have some update on that. Yes. All right, and with that, we are going to go into the message for today. So if you can find your Bible, find in your Bibles, um, the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning at verse 9. That is John chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. It is John chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. And it reads thus. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, Many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they heard he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. So today, if you're taking notes, um, the title of today's message is a different Palm Sunday story. That is a different Palm Sunday story. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to come before you. We thank you that now we've gotten to this moment of the preached word. We pray that you would just move through me. I ask that you would use me as a vessel. 
ready to be used by you for your glory to minister to these, your people. I pray that you will direct me, um, direct my words, direct my thoughts, direct my actions. We just ask that you would take full control at this moment and that you would get to glory out of all that we do in this moment and that you would use me so that we all can leave this moment with a better understanding of you and your word and what you expect for us to do in this environment, in this society. These things we ask in your son in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So for the past two weeks, I've been focused on the story of, well, Martha and Mary, respectively. As I focused on misunderstood women in scripture, what I didn't realize when I chose to focus on Mary and Martha was just how well their story flowed into Palm Sunday. Because traditionally, when we focus on Palm Sunday, we start with the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. You know, sometimes we focus on some of the other gospel accounts for where Jesus got the donkey and how his um, disciples, you know, worked hard to prepare the conditions for him to come in and fulfill the messianic scriptures that had been written about him. But we don't really focus on where Jesus was coming from and some of the other things that were happening in the background. And that's why I chose to call this message a different Palm Sunday story, because there was a lot more going on that day than we tend to acknowledge. And although I'm only able to focus on a few additional concepts during the sermon, I want to make it clear to you all that yeah, there are a lot of other Palm Sunday stories that take place aside from the main one that we focus on, or should I say some things that help us to get a better understanding of just how complex of a day Palm Sunday really was, you know, within our understanding of Holy Week. But for the purposes of this sermon, I felt led to focus on the role of Lazarus, which is important, the role of Lazarus in making Palm Sunday what it was. Hence the reason that this particular message is a natural outgrowth of the sermons for the past two weeks on Lazarus's sisters, Martha and Mary. So in this message, the goal is to just go over some things that we can learn from the way Lazarus and his individual story impacted Palm Sunday in a way that will help all of us to understand the complexity that comes with being used by God in a major way. The complexity that comes from having a great and challenging testimony that goes against a lot of what um, this world and our society teaches us is possible. But before I get into that, I want to give you some background information. So we pick up this week where we left off last week. And for those who need a reminder, I'm going to give you one. So um, last week's message focused, it actually started at the beginning of this chapter. So John chapter 12, beginning at verse one, where we see that we're in Bethany and there is a host, I mean, there's a feast that's being hosted by Martha, because as we've explained for the past few weeks, um, Martha's particular ministry, the thing that she did, the thing that she did in service to God um, was something that she was able to run out of her house. And we know that Martha would host feasts and those feasts she used to bring people together. And those feasts would be places that people were able to minister. You can say that she provided an atmosphere for other types of ministry to occur. And during this feast that Martha had hosted in honor of Jesus being in town, Mary makes the decision to make a costly perfume and anoint the feet of Jesus using her hair. Of course, after she did this, um, which even at that point would have been a very humble and yet unconventional form of worship, Judas Iscariot um, immediately criticizes her because he says that the perfume was so expensive and that what she really should have done is sold the perfume or the material she used to make it and then donated the money to the poor. But we later see, based on what John writes um, in the description, that Judas didn't really care about that. His problem was that Judas was a thief. And if Mary had donated the money instead of using it herself for this perfume, 
the money would have just gone into the pot that Judas had been stealing from. So Judas's real problem was that Mary's form of worship prevented him from being able to have access to this money that she would have made from selling this expensive perfume if she had done it. But what happens here is that instead of Jesus calling out Judas as a thief and a hypocrite, which, like I've said, John makes it clear that Judas was both. Jesus just defends Mary's right to show her love to him in that way. And he also states that he wouldn't always be around. So, see, while I didn't go into that last week, um, Jesus statement and how he responded to Judas is important for Palm Sunday, as well as the overall Holy Week narrative that we focus on in scripture. Because even though I pointed out that Mary's actions, that Mary's act of showing love to Jesus, that Mary's act of worship, as we could um, perceive it now, was could have been rooted in gratitude for Jesus resurrecting her brother Lazarus, it has also been portrayed as prophetic. Meaning Mary knew that she ha- this would have been her last chance to do some kind of grand gesture to Jesus based on what Jesus was about to face. And in fact, Jesus's own defense of Mary and the costly nature of Mary's actions suggests that he himself was acknowledging that his end was near. So Mary's prophetic and unconventional actions set the tone for the next day, the next day being Palm Sunday, when Jesus would leave the feast that Martha had prepared for him in Bethany and head to Jerusalem, where, you know, he would ride in on the donkey as people shouted Hosanna, just as scripture had prophesied. And that brings me to my first point here, which is that on Palm Sunday, Jesus was at his most popular, but he was at his most popular in part because of the resurrection of Lazarus. So it's clear when you examine the scene of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey that Jesus was very popular. I mean, all the gospel accounts make it clear that there were people like lining the road to see Jesus and shouting and praising, you know, it probably would be like the equivalent of, honestly, the best example I have would be for people in my generation remembering watching the Michael Jackson concerts where people would pass out when they saw him. Like, (laughs) I'm just saying that Jesus was pretty much a rock star. Like, everybody wanted to be around him. Everybody loved him. People would shout when they saw him. Like, it was big. And and I'm saying this because sometimes we have a way of even spiritualizing things and, you know, envisioning something different than it was. Like, understanding that there was a lot of excitement around Jesus because of a lot of things that Jesus had been doing and just because of the reputation that had been built up. So, and you can imagine to have a huge crowd following him around and lining the streets just so that they could see him in a time period before social media, before cameras, you know, when pictures were just painted at best, like you understand that, it took a lot to even get word to spread the way that it would have needed to spread for such a huge crowd to gather in that time period. So I just want to say that so we understand that a crowd the size of what was following Jesus around was all the more revolutionary at that time period when you consider how few modes of communication it really had available to them. But anyway, but scripture makes it clear that the crowd had been growing in that area for days. And it it wasn't only because Jesus was in town, but it's because the people wanted to see Lazarus too. See, if you understand the geography of Israel during that time period, what you get is that Bethany, which is where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived, wasn't too far from Jerusalem. And we know that Lazarus' story itself was indeed amazing. See, we forget the part that not only had he been buried, but this means that there was a funeral. Like Lazarus was legitimately in a tomb that had been closed. So that means that um, 
this was not one of those ambiguous cases where, you know, somebody may have been asleep or in a coma or passed out or whatever. Like, no, Lazarus was dead. In fact, Lazarus was so dead that scripture implies that his body had already begun to decompose. And if Lazarus's story itself wasn't amazing enough to spread on his own, the fact that his sisters, Mary and Martha, were known in the community as associates with Jesus would have also helped his story to spread. I mean, their reputations would have made sure that the word spread first about Lazarus's sickness and then about Lazarus's death itself. Like, they were pillars of the community. So the resurrection would have certainly been an unexpected occurrence even in the lives of people who knew Jesus and were privy to his miracles. And so you can imagine that news of that would have spread like, well, wildfire, just because of who Mary and Martha were and because of how big of a deal it is for somebody to really come back to life after being bound and put in a tomb after their funeral. Like, so... Jesus' presence, as well as the proximity of Lazarus, thanks to Bethany being so close to Jerusalem, were reasons for the size of the crowd, not to mention the amazing feast that Martha had hosted in Bethany on the night before Palm Sunday. I'm just throwing that out there because, as I've said for weeks, sometimes we try to diminish the work of people like Martha who are diligently working in the background to provide the atmosphere both physical and spiritually, physically and spiritually, in order for the rest of us to use our ministry gifts that God has given us. So that's why I just want to point out that Martha's feast and Martha's ability to plan large events like this was also a big part of why the crowd was so big on Palm Sunday. But Yeah, scripture does record that Lazarus' story was a part of the reason that many Jews at the time began believing in Jesus. So what can we learn from this? You see, sometimes reading scripture and quoting scripture and quoting theology doesn't reach people the way that our personal stories can. I mean, think about it. Early in Jesus' ministry, people thought he was crazy when he talked about being the Messiah. Indeed, as I talked about before, people in Jesus' hometown of Galilee literally wanted to kill him because they thought he had lost his mind when he said scripture was being fulfilled in him at the beginning of his ministry. But it was a story of the stories of the people whose lives Jesus touched. Those are the stories that helped his ministry to grow. You know, people like the man who was born blind or people like the Samaritan woman at the well or people like the woman who had been bleeding for years or like the Roman centurion. See, when Jesus made a difference in their lives, those people, whether they shared their stories or because people witnessed their stories, those people's stories helped people to understand that Jesus was real, Jesus was sincere in what he was saying. And those stories made Jesus, his claims of being the Messiah, all the more believable. And so when we think about the power of our testimonies, like I know that in my time in ministry, I may be like tempted to fall back on my theological training to answer difficult and challenging questions that come my way. But often I find that people, they don't really want that. They want something practical they can grasp, like a story of how God has taken care of me during some of my lowest moments or a story of how God gave me the strength to persevere through some of the toughest times in my life. See, sometimes those of us who have been Christians for a long time don't like to talk about the things that God has brought us through because we want to hold on to this veneer of perfection. But transparency and vulnerability are what people really want and need in this time. And that's why it's important for us to be okay with sharing our testimonies when we have the chance to do so. The point is that like the story of Lazarus, our own personal stories can play a major role in how people come to know Jesus for themselves. So we shouldn't be afraid to share them. Or we shouldn't shrink back from our stories when they're so big, like in the case of Lazarus's, that the story can take on a life of its own. Because we know Lazarus wouldn't have really had to share much about that. All Lazarus had to do was walk and people like, oh, wait, that's the, that's the one Jesus brought back from the dead. You know, so sometimes we might not even want to be that readily identifiable with our testimonies, but the story is so big 
that our testimony might precede us where we go. But the point I wanted us to understand is that we shouldn't be afraid of our testimonies, whether that means we shouldn't be afraid to share them or we shouldn't shrink back from them when people know our testimonies because those testimonies bring glory to God and those testimonies help people to understand in a more practical sense what God can do for them. So, and this brings me to my second point, which is that the chief priests, as it says in scripture, were so bothered by the resurrection of Lazarus that they actually planned on having Lazarus killed. And so if you read scripture closely, you find that this fact, which is listed in verse 10 of this particular chapter, is actually not all that surprising. Because the religious establishment had always looked for ways to discredit Jesus. You know, if you recall, in John chapter 9, in the story of the man who had been born blind, the Pharisees actually challenged him because they didn't want him to keep saying that Jesus was the reason that he had received his sight. They asked his parents if he actually was really blind at birth. And even though the man kept saying, well, all I know is that I don't know what kind of man this was. I just know that I was blind and now I see they called him evil and wicked and cast him out of his community all because he wouldn't discredit Jesus. You know, so there are other incidents within scripture that are similar where the Pharisees went out of their way to try to discredit anything Jesus did. And, you know, we understand why they did this. We understand that the Pharisees, the chief priests, the Sadducees, in general, the religious establishment didn't like what Jesus represented because Jesus came in and critiqued them and let them know that this system of power, the structure of power that they had built was not in line with what God wanted from them, that they found a way to be wealthy and powerful and prestigious by using God's law to oppress others. And that wasn't what Jesus came to do. So what can we learn from this though? That sometimes the plots that appear to be against us are actually about what we represent. I mean, I'm sure that Lazarus would not have been comforted by the fact that the death threats against him wouldn't have been considered personal. But it does help us when we sit back and wonder What, if anything, we could have done differently to prevent that person from disliking us and talking about us? Or what we could have done to keep that group of people from excluding us or mocking us? Sometimes the answer really is nothing. Sometimes the answer really is that the things that God is doing in our lives or has done, that those things act as a trigger to the people who act to get out against us. Because that's one thing, the things that God does for us can and often do make it clear to the people around us that God is real. However, for people who have issues with God, you know, seeing God working in our lives can just encourage them to take those issues out on us. And if we're honest, it's not even always issues related to belief in God. So I don't want you to say that I'm only talking about atheists or people with church hurt or whatever. Sometimes it's issues related to how God chooses to work. That's right. Sometimes believers can be jealous of one another's callings, giftings, and anointings. Sometimes instead of being encouraged, when we see God move through someone else, we wonder why God doesn't move through us in that same way. But we don't know their story. And honestly, if we did, we might not want to go through what they did to get that anointing, you know, to get that calling, to have God work through them in that kind of mighty way. Remember, Lazarus actually had to die in order to receive that amazing testimony. You know, most people wouldn't want to do that. I know I personally wouldn't want to have to do that. You know, so just keep in mind when you see God working through somebody in an amazing way, remember, you don't know what they had to go through to get that. And you only see the positive side of what they had to go through. You only see the attention that they may be getting from it. But you don't know, like, the discipline that they have to go through to keep. You don't know what their prayer life it looks like. You don't know how much they had to study scripture. You don't know how much hurt and pain and rejection they may have gone through to get to that point. All you see is the good side. So I just want to remind you of this, that Lazarus's um, resurrection reminded the chief priests 
and the Pharisees of how powerful Jesus really was. And as a result, they plan to take away the very thing from him that Jesus had just given him back, which was his life. And people do that. People will be angry with us when God works through us. People may misunderstand the power that God has given us, where it comes from. And people may underestimate what we had to go through in order for God to use us the way that he does. But just don't lose heart and understand that even if your testimony makes you a target, even if the gift that God gives you makes you a target, God is still with you in the process. And that no matter what those people may try to do to you, they can't do anything unless God allows it. And even if God allows it, it's for his glory. And this brings me to my last point, which is that during the triumphal entry, the Pharisees realized there was nothing they could do to stem the popularity of Jesus as long as he was alive. So even though the passage that I chose to read for today stops with the Pharisees saying, well, there's nothing we can do about this. The world has already gone after him. You could also see that it was this incident that made it clear to the Pharisees that there was nothing else they could do about Jesus to prevent his popularity, to prevent him from being a threat to their way of life outside of killing him. Like that is the implication from this. <coughs> and it's not all that far fetched when you consider that Jesus had already foretold of his death by now. As I said earlier in this chapter, he took Mary's um, unconventional and expensive way of worship as indicative that she understood that his time was ending. And he made it clear to those around him he wouldn't always be there. And in this chapter itself, after this particular passage that I selected to read for today, he also predicts his death a few more times. So it's not like Jesus didn't see it coming. But that is actually the sad part of this, that Jesus knew he was so much of a threat to the way of lives of the religious establishment, which in this case would have been represented as the chief priests and the Pharisees who were in this chapter. But these were people who, as people of faith, should have actually been on his side, but instead set a plan in motion um, for his death because it upset their sensibilities by that much. So just think about like how sad it is. Like These are people who literally make their living professing themselves to be you know, the closest ones to God, the ones that can direct people to God. And then when God in the flesh says, you know what, there are some things about what you're doing that are not pleasing. They're like, oh, we got to get rid of him. And it's like, even though it was clear by this point that nobody but through the power of God could have done the things that Jesus was doing. Like, up, oh, there are too many people following him and our way of life will be ruined if he continues moving forward with this level of power. So we have to destroy him. But if there's anything that we understand in our society, it's that our society can't handle revolutionaries. True revolutionaries are often assassinated by the powers that would be, the powers that would stand and lose a lot if real change ever occurred. I mean, think about it. Even within the 20th century, we had Martin Luther King Jr. who was killed while in town in Memphis trying to support black sanitary public workers, but public works employees who had been striking because of unfair treatment based on race. His message of equality, even in the workplace, was considered too revolutionary. Or we can think about Malcolm X, who left the Nation of Islam and began promoting Pan-Africanist thought and unity at the time that he was assassinated. Why? Because too many people benefit from division. And so the fact that he was working to get people to come together made him too much of a threat. Or if you saw the movie recently, um, Judas and the Black Messiah, or if you just were a history buff in general, you know that Fred Hampton was doing a great job of uniting poor people of all racial backgrounds um, to fight against the powers that be. But you also know that, like in the cases of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, that Fred Hampton was a target of J. Edgar Hoover and was ultimately assassinated because they feared that 
his influence was just getting too large. The point I'm making is that the concept of having your biggest threat killed is something that still persists to this day. And even if it's not taking place in the form of the assassination of an individual, it still takes place in the form of discrediting said revolutionaries. I mean, for instance, we know that J. Edgar Hoover was known in his efforts to discredit civil rights leaders, you know, tapping their phones, um, trying to catch them in compromising situations. But we also know that he had his own list of what were referred to as spiritual, I mean, a spiritual special correspondence that he actually like employed to deliver his messages um, against civil rights and against civil rights leaders to largely unsuspecting black audiences. And I know I've said this in the past, but I'll say it again, that my father's family actually grew up in such a congregation where their leader is a documented special correspondent that worked for J. Edgar Hoover. And he spoke up against Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement. Yes, yes, if for those of you. You all, for those of you who didn't hear that, First Lady Tia asked, was, the, was this man black? Yes. Well, she said, she didn't ask if he was black. She said he was black. And yes, he was black. It's just pointing out there that there were efforts that were made by the government at the time to discredit the work of civil rights leaders. And that oftentimes black people were a part of these efforts that, um, oh great, I'm forgetting his name, but the guy from um, Jews and the Black Messiah, the one that Lakeith Stanfield played, he was not the only black person that was employed to try to break down the civil rights movement or break down a revolutionary leader. There were a lot of people, some did it more directly as we saw in this movie, some did it in a more indirect way as the minister that I mentioned who my family grew up under. And then even if the revolutionaries were not assassinated or discredited directly, barriers were often put in place to prevent the change the revolutionaries strove for from happening. And by this, I'm referring to what we're seeing right now in the aftermath of the Biden-Trump presidential election. We were all very excited when Georgia ended up being the state that not only turned blue to help Joe Biden and Kamala Harris win the White House, but also delivered Democrats the Senate, thanks to Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. But last week, Republicans in Georgia passed a bill that would ensure that many of the strategies that Democrats used in order to win the state would never work again. See, now the polls close at five o'clock, even though most people work nine to five jobs. And see, it also makes it harder to request um, absentee ballots and turn in those, ba it, it, so it makes it harder to request and turn in absentee ballots. And why we know this is because absentee ballots and mail-in ballots largely went in Biden's favor. It also closes polling locations on Sundays because as we know, a lot of black churches organized events where they called souls to the polls where like whole congregations would, after service was over, go and march to their polling locations and wait in line for early voting. So now they can't do that anymore. And then to make matters worse, they even made it illegal to give people food or drinks while they're in line waiting for the polls, which of course will prevent some people from being able to wait in the extremely long lines that exist in many blacker parts of Georgia. And we know that a lot of those lines exist because for some suspicious reason, the areas that have larger black populations miraculously have fewer polling locations that are open. So now they already had to stand in line for hours with limited hours and you can't give them things to encourage them to stay in line like just a sip of water. Like, it's illegal. Like, I think it's a felony now. And this passed, and it's sad that this kind of bill could pass. We, we know it's clearly a voter suppression bill. But, unfortunately, it won't be able to be overturned so easily, thanks to, to the Supreme Court, which gutted the preclearance portion of the Voting Rights Act during the Shelby County case in 2013. For those who just need a real quick refresher, the preclearance portion, it pretty much what it meant is that there were certain 
states and counties across the country that based on their history, any change they made to their voting regulations had to be approved by um, the Department of Justice. But in 2013, um, the Supreme Court said that the formula that was used to decide which states and which counties fell under this preclearance jurisdiction was not valid anymore, that it wasn't fair because it used data that was over 40 years old. But instead of saying, you know what, let's revamp the formula, they gutted the formula. So as a result, those states and counties that were under preclearance now no longer had to submit their plans to change their voting regulations to the, uh, I mean, to the Department of Justice before anything went into place. And you will notice that in a lot of those states, the minute that Supreme Court ruling came down, they started passing a lot of policies that would definitely have failed under the prior like preclearance era, meaning the Department of Justice would say, nope, it's pretty clear cut that you're doing this to try to prevent, well, for the most part, black people from voting. But now the way it works is the Department of Justice would in turn have to bring a case to the Supreme Court. So in other words, the Department of Justice would have a lot more work in order to overturn such a law. And we also know that we have a more conservative majority in the Supreme Court that might not be as amenable to changing such a thing. So that's what I meant by it's gonna be a lot harder to change than it would have been even 10 years ago. And the point I was making is that overall, with these examples I gave, our society has a way of stifling revolutionaries, whether it's by assassinating them, assassinating their character, or by putting barriers in place that would, in the end, stifle revolutionary thought. And thus, as sad as it is, we shouldn't be surprised when we look back over this time period to see that Jesus at his most popular and at his most powerful, that seeing Jesus in that way led the Pharisees and the chief priests and others in the religious establishment to recognize the futility of their actions to stop him from gaining the level of influence that he had, but would also be enough for him to see the only way that we can stop him is to kill him and neutralize the threat that he represented once and for all. So sometimes we wonder, how did we go from Palm Sunday to Good Friday so quickly? This was the answer. So as I end this, I just want to remind you all that the story of Lazarus and Palm Sunday was a complex one. Because on one hand, the uniqueness of the story of Lazarus was used to bring great glory to God. You know, lots of people came to know Jesus Lots of people came to understand that Jesus was the son of God. Lots of people developed better relationships with God as a result of Lazarus' story. But on the other hand, his story also made him a target for the powers that be, those who were threatened by Jesus' power. And because of the popularity of Lazarus' story, which also increased Jesus' popularity, Lazarus' story, in a way, led to the ultimate decision to end Jesus' life. And although we do know how the story ends and what Jesus' death represents for us, I'm bringing this up to underscore the fact that being honest about your testimony is not an, always an easy thing to do. Sometimes it is risky. Sometimes it is life-threatening. Sometimes it can make you a target, especially when God has brought you through things that our society says are not possible. But remember that God brought you through what he brought you through so that you could share that with others. Jesus didn't just bring Lazarus back from the dead so that no one would talk about it. Jesus did it to identify himself as the Messiah. And in that same way, when God brings us through things, he does it so that others can see his power moving in our lives. And it's not always a walk in the park. Sometimes we will experience the high highs like a Palm Sunday. And sometimes we experience like the low lows, like what we know as Christians that happened to Jesus a few days later on Good Friday. But ultimately, we have to trust that when God gives us a testimony, he does it for his glory. And we have to use what God gave us um, 
for the furthering of his mission in this place that he set us. So in the end, I just want to encourage you just the whole point of this message was to understand that Jesus popularity on Palm Sunday was really in some ways the result of the work that Mary and Martha had done by building this relationship with Jesus and the fact that Jesus chose them and chose their brother as a means of getting the glory that he needed so that people would understand who he was. And, but ultimately that incident is what led to his death on Good Friday. So I just want to encourage all of you, don't be afraid of your testimony. Don't shrink back from your testimony. No matter what it may look like, no matter what it may feel like, God is planning to get the glory out of the testimony that he gave you. And in the end, it's still going to work out for his glory no matter what it looks like in the moment. So God bless all of you. So now we're going to open up the doors of the church. So I know that this was a bit of a complex message because, yeah, usually when we talk about um, Palm Sunday, we talk about it in, you know, more happy, jovial terms because of the fact that it really was the last big celebration, you know, leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. But I felt that it was important to bring up the fact that, yeah, even our great moments sometimes have dark things happening behind the scenes and that we shouldn't be surprised if our powerful moment in God just leads people to come up against us later. And that's why it's important for all of us to have that clear and strong relationship with Jesus so that we know what's happening, so that we can make sense of what's happening around us, and so that we can trust that God is still with us, no matter if things look great or things look bad, to know that we have the assurance that God is walking beside us. And you may wonder, well, how can I have that assurance to know that God is walking beside me, God is with me, God is using the things that have happened in my life for his glory, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like in the moment. Well, the answer is you need to have that personal relationship with Jesus. You need to know that he is with you. You need to know how to pray. You need to know how to read scripture. You need to know the importance of fellowship, the importance of surrounding yourself with people who can build you up at times that you're down. And all of that really starts with this one prayer right here that's in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And it says here that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So that's all you have to do. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and you will be saved. And that is the first step to building that personal relationship with God, the kind of relationship with God that we know that Mary and Martha and Lazarus had. And so if you would like to build that kind of relationship with God for yourself, you just have to repeat this prayer after me. Say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart, that you raised him from the dead. I'll say that one more time and say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations, you're saved and you can now begin that personal relationship with Jesus. And we would like to help you with that, whether that means you becoming a part of this ministry or, you, or us helping you unite with another place. We would just love to hear from you we encourage you to fill out a contact card so we can reach out to you. You'd hear from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. We'd pray with you and help you figure out what your next steps are in this Christian journey. Or maybe you're somebody who's been 
watching this ministry for a bit or this was your first time watching it but either way you have already accepted jesus christ as your lord and savior and you feel that god is leading you to become a part of this ministry if that is you we also encourage you to fill out a contact card you know the contact card has a lot of space for you to say what you're filling it out for and we would pray with you and help you to do what our tagline says which is live god's will for your life and so you would hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon and we'd help you to figure out just where you fit into this ministry and how we can assist you on your journey or maybe you're somebody who's in need of prayer you can also fill out your prayer request on the contact card or lastly you might just be somebody who you know you could be a part of another church but you just want more information about what we do as we mentioned we are in the process of putting together an official mailing list with a newsletter but for now you would still hear from us about the events that we're having and some of the new developments and some of the announcements that we will have in the next few weeks about this ministry well if you would like to be on our mailing list we also encourage you to fill out a contact card that way we'll add you to the mailing list it's an email list that way we'll add you to our email list once it is up and running so with that we thank you all for watching for your prayers for your support Thanks again to all the women who've been supporters of this ministry during this Women's History Month. We really appreciate all of you. And yeah, we just thank you for spending time with us, praising and worshiping God. And we hope that we will see you next week for Resurrection Sunday slash Communion Sunday slash our first pastoral anniversary. So it's going to be quite a celebration. We hope you're here for it. And we just, yeah, thank you for spending this time with us praising and worshiping God. And now I'm going to close this out in prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the word that was preached and we pray that you would help us not to shy away from the power of the testimony that you've given us, but to see how our testimonies can really be used for your glory we also pray for all those who are still being impacted by the pandemic we thank you that first lady and i are fully vaccinated and that so many people in our lives are fully vaccinated but we pray for those who are still trying to get access to the vaccines um we just thank you that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel but we know that we as a society still have a long way to go and we know that vaccine distribution hasn't always been equitable. And we also know that there's still a lot of misinformation about there, out there about the vaccine, such that there are many people who still don't want it. But we thank you that this pandemic is getting under control and that hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to get back to some semblance of normalcy in this country. But we also still pray for those who are experiencing health challenges as a result of the pandemic, those who are experiencing financial challenges, those who are sick, those who lost loved ones, those who are just worried, those who need to know where you are in the midst of this. We pray that you would show yourself in those situations and help us to remember that you do have it all under control and help us to trust you in this time. We also pray about the level of political division that exists within this country. We know that there still are people who will not talk to each other as a result of their political affiliations. And we just pray that you would help us figure out what needs to be done to build bridges in this country. And I'm not saying build bridges in the sense of just ignore offensive views. But I'm saying, or just ignore difference. I'm saying we need to value difference. We need to appreciate difference. We need to encourage difference and make space for difference while still coming together. We need to embrace diversity, not hide it. And I just pray that you would help us to be a part of that in this society. We also pray about the um, rampant gun violence that's impacting our country. We know we've had 
a lot of mass shootings in recent years, in recent months, honestly. We know we've had a lot of shootings in our cities recently, and we know that it's a complex problem, but we know that it's a problem that you can solve. So we ask that you would just make it clear to us what steps we can take as individuals and as one body in Christ to help take care of this particular issue. We also ask for prayers for the family of the 11 year old who was killed a few days ago. Um, We know no parent likes to, well, no parent should have to bury their child and especially to senseless gun violence like that. We ask that you would wrap your arms around that family and be a source of comfort. We know that sometimes there's just no explanation for why these sorts of things can happen, but we just pray that you will show yourself as a comforter to that family and raise up the support that they'll need to get through this trying time. And we thank you for keeping us. We thank you for protecting us. And we pray that you continue to work within this ministry and help it to be all that you envisioned it to be when you inspired us to start it all these years ago. And now we pray that when we leave this place and in this broadcast, that you will continue to watch over us, that you will get the glory out of all that we do, that you will get to praise out of all that we do and worship out of all that we do, and that people will come to know more about you through their interaction with us. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all, and we will see you next week.